Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Sister Sierra. <laughs> Amen. Amen, Sister Tommy. Sister Stalo. Amen. Good evening as we gather. Sister Keith, so glad to see you on online. God bless you. Zebronia. Hey man, everybody, all GHT. Brother Derek. I mean, just everybody as you're coming on. We'll be getting started very soon. This will be the closing lesson to our to our wilderness experience. And uh, Brother Arthur, just everyone, Tommy says Pam, just everyone. Uh, also, I plan on posting, I got a good recommendation on a, a book that possibly others will be interested in, and I'm going to post it on GHT website. It's just something that is that kind of uh, has some parallel ideas to some of the things we have been discussing, particularly particularly on the wilderness experience of David. And so I'll be posting that. It's a book by, I believe his name is Max Lucado. And uh, we, will, we will do that just in case you're interested in reading more. But this is gonna be the end of that study in the wilderness. And I pray that this has been a blessing to you the as as we've been talking about the wilderness we see that there are multiple experiences in the wilderness and the wilderness is not necessarily a bad place it is a place where you can not not if you're there with god and it is and that is the important thing that if you, even if you're in a wilderness place in your life as long as you are there with god so as we're coming on and saying hello to each and every everyone, this is kind of our fellowship time where we say, hey, how you doing? And I pray that you had a good Thanksgiving, that not only was it full of fellowship, but it was done wisely, and safely, with love and unselfishness as we are, we are coming back. And I am praying, believe me, I am praying that that it will not be as bad as they anticipated it being. And that people, at least uh, more people, were careful than not. So we will see. Amen. So in about a minute, we'll get started. Sister Thay, I see you. Sister Diane. Sister Phyllis. Sister Jean. Yes. Good, good afternoon. God is good. God is faithful. There's a lot of things have happened. We've been even informed of some, some other deaths within the Church of God in Christ. One of our general board members. Another one. And yet, God is faithful and he has allowed us to be here. So anyway, let, let's, let's begin. I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started with our study. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you. We thank you so much for how good you have been to us. You have been faithful to us. We thank you. We glorify you. We magnify your name. Oh God, we thank you for this time of Bible study, this time really of, of not only our searching your, your word and, and getting the knowledge that you have for us to, to live by, to strengthen us, to encourage us, but we even thank you for this fellowship time, we who are together searching the scriptures so that we all can walk before you and that we can encourage one another 
to good works, oh God. Love and good works, even in your word, even as we are studying your word. Thank you, Lord. Be here with us. Give us understanding, oh God, and let the seed of your word fall on prepared and good ground and spring up into life for our lives. And God, I submit myself to you that you will help me to give words and utterances that will edify everyone that can hear what we're doing right now, that your purpose will be accomplished and you ultimately will be glorified. I pray in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so so we have we had been on this journey from the wilderness, starting from the wilderness experience even of of Abraham to Moses. Uh, there were other wilderness experiences. We went all the way to the wilderness experience of David, and certainly he had a, a, a wilderness experience. And the most profound, of course, was when he was running from Saul. Then there are other wilderness experiences, the wilderness experience of, of Elijah, where he had to really trust God. And then from that place had to listen, was, was enabled to hear what God had to say. And so as we graduated, we finally go to the wilderness experience of Jesus. The last time we talked about Jesus being led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. So there was a purpose for him to go and be led into the wilderness. And so finally, uh, what I wanted to talk about really is the other Jesus' other use of the wilderness, if you will, or of that apartness. Because remember what we said, that the wilderness is a place where you are pulled away or taken away or moved away from your, your usual surroundings. You move away. Abraham was said, come, come, come out of this place. His father had taken him to Haran. And then, then God says, look, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your kin. I want you to leave your family to a place where I will show you. So the wilderness was going to be, for Abraham, uh, a place where God would actually show him, teach him who he was, and show him not only where he wanted him to end up, but show him now who he wanted him to, who he wanted him to be in him. God gave him a different identity in the wilderness. Sometimes God wants to give us a different identity in the wilderness. So we see, we see that the wilderness was that place. And for the children of Israel, the wilderness was a place of preparation. It was a place of testing. It was a place of preparation. It was a place where God was actually giving them information and creating and molding them into the nation that he wanted them to be. So the wilderness was, was that. They learned who they were, and they learned most of all who God was. He revealed himself. He revealed his glory in the wilderness. Same for David. Even if, if we push on, David found out exactly who God is, but God was also preparing him because he would one day be the king. He had already anointed him, but now he was preparing him to be the king of his nation, the king of Israel. He was also learning how to depend on God. He was learning even things about his own character. The, and the wonderful thing is that in the wilderness, I believe that David's worship, as he discovered who God was, and as he discovered who he was, as he discovered the own faults within himself, that his worship was taken to a different level. Yes, he composed things when he was tending the sheep. He played his heart. But when you're on the run for your life, I mean, you find out God in a different way. And I believe that that's what happened to David. And we learned that while he was in the desert or while he was in the wilderness, that he, he, wrote several of the psalms that we say today, and some of them are the greatest psalms, to the point that we repeat them over and over again and quote from them over and over again because of what David discovered. So now we we move on. So that, that that's what the wilderness is. It was a place for Jesus to be tested. But then we find out, and this is what I want to explore, that it was a place of communion, and this is for Jesus. It was a place in the wilderness for communion. It was a place for restoration. It was a place for for uh, 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 refreshing. It was it was a place for him to have communion and fellowship with God to become even more one with the Father, and that is a very important thing. And so we're going to explore that 
right now. It is important for us to get alone with God. So the wilderness, so that, that place away, away from your regular, away from the family, away from the crowds, away from all the pulls in your life. We, in order for us really to survive in the Lord and to thrive, let's go beyond that, to thrive in the Lord, we need to get away. We need to go into the wilderness. We need to have a wilderness place where we indeed, each of us, can get alone with God. And Jesus meant, was our example of that. So I want to first of all, I want to talk about just that encouragement, uh, the encouragement of prayer. So, so in Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus in on his Sermon on the Mount, he talks about prayer and he gives us he gives us a, a model for prayer. But he has he has a a, a a a thing that he says about prayer that this example of even how we should approach prayer. And although, although public prayer in itself is not bad, it, it, it's only when public prayer, when you prob publicly pray so that men will see, that's the problem. So the, when you're expecting people to say, oh, he can really pray, woo, let, yeah, you want that, no. Then you're praying so that people can see just how well you can pray or just how how holy and, and sanctified you are, then that's a problem. But here, here, is, here is the thing. Jesus was promoting that, that alone time, that alone prayer. And the, the alone kind of prayer, the alone time in prayer that enables you to sincerely, to sincerely pray publicly, where as you lead prayer, you're actually bringing us all together in prayer. There's a time. Public prayer is a place where we're all trying to get with one accord, with one mind, speaking the same thing. And that person who is designated to lead us in that prayer needs to be sincere. And thus, they need to have their own individual prayer life. You need to be praying alone. It is not, you, look, you are not a, a mature Christian. You're not developing your maturity in the Lord if you don't have an alone time with God, if you don't have a, a prayer life that is away from when everyone else is praying. And so in the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus just gives this, this instruction. I'll just start at the fifth verse. I'm not saying that anybody is a hypocrite, but... He gives this instruction and says in the sixth chapter of Matthew, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they pray to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. That's when it's wrong, when you're doing it to be seen, when you're doing it so that people uh, pat you on the back and give you glory. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yeah. But thou, when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet or into thy inner room or into your own secret place. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So all, all that right there, Jesus is saying that you, we, I, all need to have a prayer life that is away from the public eye. Is not the public. The public is not even family prayer. Each individual is family prayer is very good, very very wonderful. I encourage it that families pray together. But each individual person who has a relationship with the Lord in that family needs to have their alone time with God. You need to pray. You need to have a place where you close the door and it's just you and God. And the encouragement to pray goes on just just Jesus says says this he just he he says that that men ought to always pray and not faint that's Luke 18 or more so that that we should always be praying and and pray and don't give up it is it is a constant thing if we read read James James and 5:11 we'll we'll see that it 
it encourages us, it talks about the efficacy of prayer, the, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much, that, that prayer is not just a, a futile, vain thing, it is not an unfruitful thing, that when we pray, and when we pray sincerely, when we pray out of the depths of our heart, it does something, it does something. So let us, let us go on and pray. First Thessalonians five seventeen just said, says that we should we should pray without ceasing. So it's just this cutting. Kind of, we should have a prayer life individually. We should have a prayer life. Ephesians the sixth chapter, and 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 then we go on to to the example of Jesus. The, Ephesians the sixth chapter really makes it a part of our armor or or the way that we. We walk with our armor because in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, it says, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And then it lists all the things that is our armor and our defense. And then it talks about that, that offensive, which is, is we take on the helmet of salvation, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is our offense. And this is the attitude or this is our stance. It says, why you have this helmet and the sword praying. Don't just stand there, but 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 while you're using your sword, while you're using the word, while you you're clothed in your full armor, praying always six eighteen, Ephesians six eighteen, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What is that? It means that prayer is part of our weaponry. We have the whole armor of God, but then once we put it on and we have the sword of the spirit, we have the sword of the spirit praying as even as you're using the word, you should be, we should be praying. Even if we're praying the word, we should be praying. We're constantly praying so that we can be able to, and ultimately this is what it's talking about, so that we can be able to stand and withstand the wiles of the devil. Prayer. And so Jesus then gives us this example of his praying. And we, we, see, we see it over and over. So I turn you back to the Gospels. And we know, it, as I said, it was for refreshing, for restoration, for strength. But it, but it, and it is also for communion, prayer, for communion, for fellowship. To, the prayer is that place where we become one with God. We align ourselves with the will of God. And that indeed is what happened with Jesus. So we start even with that first example when he is led away, even though we've talked about it, in Matthew, the fourth chapter. Matthew, the fourth chapter. It says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted, 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, we dealt with the temptation, but I just wanted to deal with just this, that for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was praying. Jesus was praying and communing with God. He was fellowshipping with the Lord. When, you're, when you, you have that one time, you look, he's away, led away in the spirit. To be tempted, but the, at the head of that, at the top of that, was fasting and praying. At the top of that was communion with the Lord, fellowship with the Lord, becoming one with God, being strengthened, being strengthened and prepared for what he was getting ready to go through. Because that's what happened in the wilderness. The wilderness will prepare you for what you're getting ready to be challenged with. And so we can purposely even be led of the Spirit to go into an alone place, a place that is apart from everything and everybody and all the, the cares of our life and all of the pulls on our life, that we go someplace so that we can refresh, strengthen, have oneness with God, get in line with, with Him, allow Him to fill us with the Spirit and fill us with all the grace that we need to face whatever challenge we're getting ready to, to face. And so in Jesus' case, Jesus was full of the Spirit. Although it said he was hungered, his body was weak. His flesh was weak, but his spirit was strong. And so that when the tempter came to him, he was able to defeat him 
with the word. Why? Because for 40 days and 40 nights, he had been in the wilderness, fellowshipping, communing with God, allowing God to pour into him the thing that he would need to come out of his temptation victoriously. That's the, what the wilderness is for us. Now, I, I point now, I go now to Mark 135, because what I want to show is that Jesus, even in these few, few books, had those, those times when he would go away, go apart from everyone else. When we are given these things in the word, we should take that, those things as an example for us. And we should even look at the circumstances around what happened before, what happened after. Mark 1, 35. In fact, I'll start really, really just above, but that's where we're going to cue in on. So Mark 1, 132. It says, and at even when the sun did set, they brought, that means all the people brought unto him all that were diseased and with them and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And this is after, in this, this instance, it was after he had healed Peter's, Peter's uh, step, uh, not stepmother, but mother-in-law, according to this account. And so then after that, after Jesus worked that miracle, they were just coming, bombarding them, bombarding Jesus with needs that he had worked this miracle and now they were bringing all those who, who needed a healing and those who had a devil and those who were paralyzed and all of those and they were bringing them to the door of that house. And Jesus didn't turn them away. It says in 34, and he healed many that were sick of the diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him and this is 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, I mean, very, very early in the morning, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. It is that example that when you, when you have poured out of yourself, when you, in, in Jesus' case, he had poured out of the spirit of the Lord in him, poured out of the healing virtue and all of those things as the people came and they came to, and he did not turn them away. He worked in healing and deliverance, cast out devils, everything that occurred. But then you have to know that this man, even in the flesh, he probably felt, felt as if he had given all. And so, and so as he rose early, when you, he rose early in the morning and went to a solitary pray, place to pray. It is that example. And let me tell you, if you, first, first you and we who are in ministry, we who, who labor in ministry, praying and, and, and ministering in the word and uh, whether we're doing it publicly or one-on-one -on -one and all of those things. When, after we have been ministering and giving out, we need a replenishing. Let, let, look, look, those who, oh, wow, those who, who are working in ministry, let me tell you, after you have been giving, 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 even of the Spirit, led of the Spirit, moving mightily in the power of God, you are physically at your weakest. You are in a very vulnerable place. It is not unusual that sometimes, sometimes the devil, as in chapter 4 of Matthew, will come to you right after there has been a great and mighty move of God. It is, it is a regular thing that there has been a great and mighty move of God and God has used you mightily and God has worked great miracles and God has confirmed who he was and confirmed his power even through the way he has used you. And it is not unusual then for the devil to come and to tempt you. 
And so, so that's where it is important after you've been giving, after you've been, been uh, ministering, it's very important out of yourself and pouring out of everything that God has given you. It is really important for you to be able to get that alone time with God to be refreshed, to be restored, just as Jesus did. Jesus, the Son of God, after he had given, it says he went to a solitary place, departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. Why? Because it wasn't going to be over. He needed to have communion with the Lord. He needed to have fellowship with the Lord, refresh, restoration, refocus, and then he continued on. It wasn't over. He would continue on working. And it, and it even lets us know that uh, uh, even while he was, if you read that, his disciples came. The people want you. The people are looking for you. At some point, we're going to have to have wisdom and say, okay, but I need some time with God. I need, I need, I need God to pour into me again. I need to make sure here I need to make sure that my relationship with him is intact. Sometimes we get in, in, in ministry, in ministry can even start taking over. I, I, please hear me. Min, ministry and the things that you're doing for God, that can start taking over. And so what going, going away to a solitary place enables you also to check and, and make sure that your relationship with the Lord is intact. Because as we learned in, the, in that scripture, it, it, in the end, it's not going to be all these things that you do. God, I prophesied in your name. God, I cast out devils. He said, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. No, I don't want, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know exactly who I am. And so it is in that time when we go away to that solitary place that it is reconfirmed who we are to God, who God is to us. We, we shore up our relationship, make sure everything is good. And, and we it even checks our motives and making sure that whatever has gone on, however God has used us, God gets the glory. Hallelujah. I pray that this is that this is good for somebody and that you're hearing what I'm saying. We need that alone time in prayer. So now I go now to the uh, Luke. Luke, the fifth chapter. It may seem I'm going going quickly, but I want to. I want to get it out, but I don't want to keep you on too long. I want to keep your attention. Luke, the fifth chapter. At the uh, 15th verse. And it says there, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Again, it is the same situation. The people started coming. And it said, and his fame grew. And the people started coming. And after a while, he, he, he certainly he, he healed who was brought to him. He certainly was freely giving of what was inside of him. But at a certain point, he had to withdraw himself into the wilderness and pray. Everybody, I mean, we all need to withdraw ourselves into that place apart. And we're calling it the wilderness, but it can be whatever place. Maybe you got a little wilderness in your house. And yeah. somebody called it in the, in the movie, somebody called it the war room. Yeah, that's, that's fine. We need to have a place. And we say that closet, that inner room. That place, or maybe it is. Maybe it's not in your house at all. Maybe it's walking along the lake. I know somebody they they walk along the lake, and that is how they here in Chicago, and that's how they they commune with God and have prayer. They walk in the park or the whatever it is. But you have to have in order to thrive in the Lord. I'm going to use that word instead of survive to thrive in the Lord. You have to have that place where you can get alone with God, especially when you've been ministering. But now I'm going to going to expand that and by extension talk about it when you have all kinds of 
pulls on your life. So maybe you're not working in healing and delivering, but you got all kinds of other pressures in your life. And there's a multitude of people, even a multitude of your family members or a multitude of your friends. A lot of people are pulling on you and they're looking to you and you, 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 you love them. And so you want them to be able to depend on you. And you, they're pulling on you and asking you for this and, and, and looking to you for that. And at some point, in order to really be healthy, be enough in the Lord to be able to minister to them, to be able to meet their needs, to be able to do the things that you that you need to do for them and to do it with love and not bitterness, not to get, get exhausted and tired and, 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 to, and, and get in your flesh where you say, I'm sick of these folks. Why do they leave me alone? You never want to come to that place. And so it's better for you to go on, uh, minister to them, do, do whatever you can, do your work, your family, and then and then know within yourself. Okay, I need to. Uh, I'm be right with you, but I need to get alone. I need to withdraw myself and get alone so that I'll be good for you. And I get alone and let God pour into me. I need to get alone and have communion and fellowship with God. I need to get alone and make sure that my my relationship with Him is strong and that that the things that I am doing, I'm doing not only to give God glory, but also that I'm doing it with joy. That I'm doing it out of the love that I have for God and how out of the love that I have for you. And that is what that alone time, that get, getting away, withdrawing even into a wilderness or a place or a solitary place, that's what that does. We, it, it, that's what that does. That's what Jesus gave us. He gave us that example. Every single, single time he, we see, every single time that he he gave of himself. And so I say, whether it's in spiritual, or whether it's just in life itself, you got grandkids, you got sons and daughters, you, that, and all of those, and, and, and there are things that you pour into their lives and you give them, and, and, and that is good. But you have to make sure that you pull away so that God can pour into you and refresh you and restore you so that you can come back to them and be able to minister in the love of God with joy, without that fatigue, the weariness. Uh, uh, that's where we want to be. So going, going apart to a solitary place. Here, here is one in the 14th chapter of Matthew where Jesus had just finished feeding 5,000. Again, again, he, he, he had given a lot of himself, fed 5,000 plus. It says basically 5,000 is just 5,000 men. 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. So who knows exactly how many there were. There could have been 20,000 people since usually there are more women and children than there are men. The fact is that miraculously, out of the power of God, out, out of what was in him, he worked this great miracle. But when, after the miracle was over, he had to send his disciples away. And so let's let's talk about this. Uh, 14, Matthew 14, 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So he sent those even who were helping him, working with him, he sent them away, sent them to the other side. He sent the multitudes away who were pulling on him. And he retired to a solitary place here in a mountain to pray, to get restored, to get refreshed. Yeah, this this may mean even even if you're you going two by two, yeah, that that sometimes you okay after you've ministered together, you need you need to separate and have some alone time with God. R withdraw apart into a solitary place or to a mountain or to whatever 
for yourself. You know, it, yeah. Here, here, here's the ultimate thing, and I always say this: we, we, when we appear before the Lord, we're not going to appear before the Lord in groups. Each individual person is going to appear before the Lord. You're not going to appear before the Lord as a couple. You're not going to appear before the Lord as a family. We're not going to appear before the Lord as a church. Each individual is responsible for their own life and for their own soul and for their own development and for their own nurture. So after all, we each individual needs to have that alone time with the Lord. Are you getting this? Yeah, yes. So whether it's ministering in the spirit or whether you're ministering just to your family, in order for you to thrive in life, in order for you to thrive in the Lord, you need to have that alone time in the wilderness or in a solitary place with God. So it, one of the interesting things about this I saw in, in the book of John, as we move in the book of John, the sixth chapter is the same account of, of Jesus going into the mountain to, to have prayer with the Lord. But it said, says there, there in John, the sixth chapter, very interesting, the 15th verse. Yes, it says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So this is yet some extra information on what was going on after Jesus had fed the 5,000 in the book of John. He gives us this. He says he, he departed because he perceived that the people that he had ministered to and had fed were going to exalt him and make him king when that's not what he came to do. He came to glorify God. He came to point man toward the Father. And so it says that it says that then Jesus departed into the mountain. And you know, sometimes that, that we have to be thinking about that as well. Not only do people pull on us, but sometimes we need to, to get alone with God, to get proper perspective, to make sure and check, check ourselves and not allow people to boost us and put us in places and, and so perceive that no, 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 what I've done, I've done, God gets the glory and let me just let me just move to that solitary place. And believe me, I understand some ministers who, who after they have have ministered uh, in in the church or wherever, some of them they just get out get out, they leave. It's like they're gone. Because they probably understand that they, that they're in a vulnerable vulnerable place. They they need to they need to get that alone, get along with God as quickly as they can. Everybody is different. Some people can can kind of defer that and fellowship with the people, holding on to the idea that as soon as I can, I, I need to get along with God, uh, give Him glory, give Him honor. Make sure my relationship is intact. Make sure that my motives were right. That I indeed was following the leading of the Lord. And allow God then to pour back into me. Pour back into my heart and in my mind. Focus me as I go to the next thing. Because see, that alone time is only in between. It is It is after something something has happened or after we've done something. And it's before something else. We're getting ready to go be challenged by something else. We're getting ready to do something else. So we stop, get along with God, and then we move then into that next thing. So finally, finally, those were examples of Jesus. And you see, if we have that many examples of Jesus going apart, at, particularly after he has, has worked in the Lord and been used by God in performing great and mighty miracles uh, yes it, it, he gives us that example then certainly we want to follow follow that and these examples are examples for us all of us all of us whether you have a, a license to preach or whether you are just ministering again to your family ministering in your job each one of us who has the spirit of the Lord we are all ministers in that in that respect we minister in in our neighborhoods we minister in our community we minister in our apartment building why because we are always 
the ambassadors for Christ. Right? Amen. So, now, finally, we get this final example of Jesus praying alone. Now, he, in this example, he takes two of his disciples. But it's rel a relatively aloneness when you consider that he had the 12 disciples and then he had many others following him and then he had he many times he had multitudes uh, following him around and so finally when he is getting ready to do his his last and final act which is the act which will which will be that which brings about our salvation and that is Jesus going to the cross he goes to a sol another solitary place and that place is in the garden of Gethsemane Again, he is relatively alone. And so I want to read this. Matthew 26, and there are other accounts in Mark and in Luke. Mark 14 and in Luke 22. But I'm reading in Matthew 26, the 36th verse. And this is the, and this is the last example of Jesus praying, really, to the Lord in an alone kind of way it says then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples sit ye here while I go and pray yonder and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began so they are three and began to be sorrowful and very heavy so they're over there but Jesus moves over again to a solitary place alone he is praying alone it's not group prayer then saith he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death tarry ye here and watch with me and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed he separated himself even in that small space from them and prayed oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. By the way, that's an exhortation even for us, you know, to watch and pray. That, that that we enter not into temptation or or even more so when temptation comes that we would be strengthened but if he can if he can get us around the test that's good but when the temptation comes that we would be strengthened because in our flesh we are weak he says the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak so we pray for strength to endure and to be victorious in whatever challenge or whatever test we're going to have. Anyway, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Talking about Judas. But more so, so Jesus, when he knew he was, he was getting ready to experience maybe some of the hardest thing he would ever experience in his life he knew he needed to go and be alone with God but sometimes we know that we're getting ready to go into and look into the face of the dragon we're going to we're going to experience we know that right now I'm walking out this door and I'm going to experience something that I know in my own strength I can't and so before I do that even as Jesus did, before he did this, he went into a garden alone to pray. And even though he took some people with him, he separated himself from them so that he could get in the face of God. And it said he fell on his face and cried out to the Lord. 
because he knew that in his flesh, this thing was bigger than what he, in his flesh he could actually handle. And to the point that says, look, if, if, if this cup can pass from me, and then, but in the spirit, he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. It is, it's, sometimes we need God to give us the courage to do what we need to do. We need God to give us the strength. We need him to give us the peace and the calm so that we'll know exactly how to do this, how to walk through it, what to say, all of those things. And so when we're getting ready to, to, to face a challenge and we know it's going to be difficult, that is the time before we do it to get away, get alone with God, get alone with God, even confess to God where you feel inadequate, where you feel that you don't have the strength. Yeah, yeah. But that's good. Why? Because it just attests to your dependence on the Lord. And it says, God, in my own strength, I can't do this. And this, is, this is more than I can really bear in myself. But God, I can do it if you strengthen me. I can do it if you help me. I can do it if you fill me with your strength. Give me courage, God. Enable me to do that thing that I cannot do in my flesh. God, your will be done. And then, and then you will have the final words that Jesus said when he says, rise. Hallelujah. He said, rise, let us be going. Amen. That, that you get that a long time with God. And you know you're getting ready to face that difficult thing. And, and, and you know you need God. You need God to give you some, <clears throat> you need him to give you some power, some assurance, and, and, uh, that, that direction, that final direction. And then when you finish with that a long time, you do what Jesus said, rise, let us be going. In other words, it's on. Let's do it. And we know, we know ultimately that he goes to the cross and that, that he is indeed, he dies. Yes, yes. And he is buried, but he rises up with victory. Hallelujah. And all power is given to him. Hallelujah in heaven and earth. Amen. Praise God. And so we then, we know that when we, have these things in our lives, whether we're ministering, giving, that, and whether we're getting ready to face something, whether we've done something, that what is vital for us, vital for our lives, enables us to thrive, is our alone time, the withdrawing ourselves from the regular stuff in our life, our alone time with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give God praise right now. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. 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 And that's our wilderness experience. Yes, sometimes you need to go into, go into the wilderness to pray so that you can face the next thing. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God, I tell you. Well, that, that is good, and I pray that that's, that has been a blessing to you. Uh, I will, will give Sister uh, Minerva the information on, on this, this book in case some of you are interested in this, in this book. And then we'll have something on the, on the wilderness experience of David. And I pray that this, this journey or this look, look in the Word and using, using the wilderness as a place of perspective has been a blessing to you. The wonderful thing about these, these lessons is that you can revisit them. You can go back all the way. You can go on that YouTube page and all those Bible studies. You can just, just hit them and you can start at the very beginning and review them and do the Bible study over and over over again. And because, because on the Bible study, the scriptures are given. If you miss those scriptures, we give them references and you can just you can just follow that. So that's just a wonderful thing about this doing this online. You can revisit this class on the wilderness experience, especially the wilderness experience with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I don't even know what time it is. Praise the Lord. Let me just look. Okay. Well, good. We did we did good. We did good. I, I thank you so much for joining us, and and uh, and uh, we're we're working, we're working on the on the next thing, and uh, 
there are a few things in my head and in my mind and, uh, and we'll get started on something else uh, on in next week so uh, cer certainly look at the GHT uh, website and we have some some uh, uh, some some things we want you to look at we know that we're in December happy December 1st Wow right okay December 1st that means God is good he's been with us hallelujah you need to be thanking God you need to be shouting right where you are this started a while ago and God has enabled us to get to December thank you God for what you have done in our lives um, but this is a time we know uh, for giving and we know that uh, just how it is in this country and there will be just all of these opportunities for us us to give and, and I will be saying something about that and even as I get counsel we have wonderful ministry coming out of Greater Holy Temple we there are many people that we we feed and give groceries and I just need to to see exactly what we need to do to help that effort and we God has opened many doors for us and we get food and it enables us to distribute but uh, but just be listening to see if we can contribute to that effort uh, and uh, yes yes and we already know that as we are generous and as we are giving God pours into our lives then you can't be God's given no matter how you try old song but uh, 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 a definite relative truth or, or relevant truth it is a truth that, that, that transcends ages. Old song, but it is still true today, no matter how you try. So anyway, praise God. Uh, um, just final word, and that is, and then we'll pray and let you go. Thank you so much, everyone. There's so many who give to us regularly. The members, you've been faithful in your giving. Then we have those who are not officially members of Greater Holy Temple, but you've been sending offerings and tithes and all those things, and we thank you. What, what we want to do is we want to be able to report back to you. you you're going to get that time of your taxes. And, and so we want to make sure that we have the information that we need to get your, your giving record back to you. So it will be helpful if you will contact the church or email the church with your information, your mailing information, so that we can send you that those letters. Um, many times in, in the church, we just hand them out, the majority, but this year we're going to have to mail them to you. So make sure, please call, and even if you think we have it, just call and confirm what your mail your mailing information is if you've been blessing us and you're not a member of holy temple that means that even if you've been zelling we don't have that information your your mailing information on the sale so email us or call the church and just give us that information so that we can mail you i'll thank you we thank you so much you enable us to continue ministry and for us it's that's what it's about it is about ministry and and we thank you for the people of god truly you are faithful in your giving thank you very much now let me pray and let you go on with the rest of your day father in jesus name we just thank you so much for how you have blessed us oh god we thank you for the the bible study and we just pray that you will stir those things up and that it will indeed feed and nurture our lives oh god we thank you for the opportunity that you give us always to get in your face, to have that alone time. It is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us and, and, and moved every obstacle so that we could have intimate alone time with you. Thank you, God. Now we ask, oh God, that as we depart this, this venue, that, oh God, that you will keep us in the safest place we know. It's in the very hollow of your hand until we come together once again to worship, praise, magnify your name, enjoy this wonderful fellowship that we have with each other. But right now we give you honor, right now we give you glory, and right now we give you this final praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah for the evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Peace be unto you. Peace be unto the saints. And remember, I love you. I love you. I love you.